Okay, good evening. Um, my name is Nida. I lead the technical team of um, a company called Active VM. Um, I'm based in, I work for this company for the past 10 years and I'm in Singapore for the past seven years. Um, I will walk you through this presentation and tell you the tale of our collaboration, col collaboration of my, my company and uh, Oracle, the, the team in charge of the JVM. And the effort we did to make um, Java 9 better on the memory side in order to manage a very large heap. My company is releasing, we, we, we build our own product, which is called Active Pivot. Active Pivot is an uh, in-memory aggregation engine. You can see it also like an OLAP in memory. I think it's the fastest OLAP engine on, on Earth as of today, since we hold everything in memory. And since the beginning, we were holding all the data in memory. I will give you some use cases later on. But back to our collaboration with Oracle. Actually, our partnership started two years ago when one of our clients asked us, are you able to handle a project which requires 16 terabytes of data that should be held in memory? So that was a serious challenge. And the, the vendor on the other side also was Oracle. So then we did a joint team to tackle that issue. Before that challenge, we used to play with maximum one terabyte um, of RAM, on servers with one terabyte of RAM. And then we moved to 16 terabyte. That was a serious challenge because the, the behind the scene, the machine that has, one may ask, well, what type of machine is that? So this, this type of machine uh, is called Oracle M6. You can find the equivalent from uh, Huawei, IBM, uh, Silicon Graphics, etc. Now every hardware vendor has such machine with a huge, with a huge uh, amount of RAM, like few few terabytes. So then we took that ch challenge in 2015. Um, we we succeeded, and then we were doing a presentation. We've been selected by uh, the Java One conference in 2015. And at that time, we were playing with um, the JDK 8. Then we moved to another challenge, which is enhancing. From that challenge, we learned a lot. And then we said, like, let's enhance a bit the perf performance metrics we had. And let's do it on Java 9, since uh, the JVM engineer were working on it. And they gave us an early release we started playing with since 2016 with the JDK 9. So we were, we felt blessed because we were in a real, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a close collaboration with those few guys who are working, who are writing the code of the JVM. And today, um, the, 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 the um, credits goes to uh, a guy called Thomas Schatzel, who is based in Austria, who is part of the JVM team. So he was the team lead there. And what I'm going to show you here is part of uh, his work. In memory computing, so some, so, so some people could say, OK, in memory, everything is in memory. Since the beginning, we load data in memory since the, like the, for the past 20 years. However, nowadays, if you, if you see the price of the RAM, between the 80s and today, it dropped by 1 million. So today, you have the opportunity to hold the whole set of data in the memory. Before, we were holding chunks of data because the memory were, was so expensive. I won't detail all the products you see there, um, but some of them, like Spark, which is quite uh, popular nowadays. Spark is quite fast because they store their RDDs, the, the intermediate results. They, the, you have the ability to store them in memory to speed up um, the computation. 
SAP HANA for the analytics. We do the same. We hold all the set of data in the memory. So then we try to be sub-second, close to the few seconds when you fire a query to our engine. Then we give you the, resp the response. For our work, we focused on a use case for the banking industry because the first challenge was made by, by, by a French bank. And for that, what we did is uh, we built a use case on an investment side called the credit risk. For those who are in the banking industry, credit risk requires a lot, a lot, a lot of data because you consume a lot of simulations, Monte Carlo simulations for those who are in that area. And then you have to, for every uh, time point, you have to do the default, like the counterparty default simulated and reprice all your positions. And you do this not on, on, on few days, you do this on like a couple of years and on every single day. So you, you end up with few terabytes uh, of, of data. That, what we did is we aggregated that and then we fired query against that use case. So that was our baseline. That project was our baseline that we gave to the JVM engineers, allowing them to play with and to um, tweak their code to, to have the best um, and the optimal performance. In terms of use cases related to the in-memory um, uh, computation, today having an in-memory engine allow you, give you an advantage um, against the competition. So if you are in the financial industry and you give such reporting to your um, end users, a trader can do some simulation before uh, booking a trade. Compute on the spot all the analytics, not wait for the end of day or for tomorrow's batch. On the e-commerce side, any uh, website that is having um, an, an online store can listen to the prices of the competition and then compute. Every time the price change, you compute and you change your strategy. From market maker, you, 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 you change your strategy and you, you just try to get rid of uh, the stock or you do flash sale. So this is, um, this is quite crucial for your business. And on the supply chain area, for instance, you have the one, one of the interesting use cases we did was um, for a company that is, has to move cars from, one, from, from uh, the, the producer to the consumer, to the resellers. And then you have an SLA. Being a mover, you have an SLA. You're, you're transporting cars here. You're not, you're not transporting paper. So there are clients at the end waiting for their car. And if you have a delay, you have to pay for it. And then you can say on the spot, this won't happen here, but what if there is a, a strike in this country? So I have to bypass this port and then deliver somewhere else, etc. So this gives you the ability to decide on the spot. So to aggregate a huge amount of data, you definitely need um, a language and a technology that gives you the ability to um, implement complex calculation to be versatile enough. And you're looking for a huge um, community that will push that solution. This is why when we started our product, we, we directly choose Java. That was 12 years ago. And I think we did the right choice. At that time, we were hesitating C++ or Java. However, plugging, like you, you're looking for a safe language. When it crashes, it doesn't crash the whole server. You're looking for some, some, something quite flexible enough. And this is why Java was the, the, the good choice at that time and still. However, the problem with Java, when we started um, 12 years ago, was the garbage collection because the scalability is not limitless. And that gave to the language somehow a bad reputation sometimes, especially those, the people that are not s using Java and then kept the ideas of like Java 1.3 or 1.1. It's like, ah, oh, it's very slow. Uh, 
applet sucks, etc. So they, some, some people are still in that mindset. However, since then, like a lot of stuff evolved and Java becomes really competitive. In two minutes, I will summarize all the effort we did in the R&D, like 10 years of effort. So some concepts may look a bit weird or you never heard about them. So do not hesitate. This is, I, I will summarize in, in two slides, a talk that we gave one year and a half ago at the spring uh, meetup at that time. Of course, you have to rely on, on, on the evolution of Java but you have to do some effort in your software as well. And this is what we did. First of all, we took control of the memory allocation. Maybe you heard about the off-heap memory in Java, to not keep everything in the heap. For instance, in our data set, we were having three terabyte, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the use case, we're having three terabyte um, in the heap, and like eight, eight, nine in the off heap. We decided that all the structures of our in-memory database will be off heap. For that, we implemented our own memory um, allocation and we implemented our own malloc. If you want to look at it, you can check uh, Java MISC unsafe, you can check the, uh, the NIO buffer, all those um, all, all those packages which are part of the JDK gives you the ability to allocate the memory yourself, but you have to do it wisely. And um, you have to know what you're doing because then you can crash the whole server. <laughs> we also took advantage of all what is the concurrent package, um, all the concurrent package Java is providing. And we use the fork join pools, we use the work stealing techniques, and most of our uh, structures are log free. We use a lot of the compare and swap. So then we minimize the contention and we maximize um, the parallel work. We also moved from, um, we also tried to partition our um, data, the way we store the data. So then we, we, we give enough work to all the cores, and we did the partitioning among all the available CPUs. So this will maximize the parallelism as well. But even more than that, we leveraged, we, we, we leveraged the new, um, what we call NUMA architecture, what we call non-uniform memory access all the huge new servers, they don't have a single memory bus anymore. They have what we call um, new nodes. So you can see it that way. You have memory chip associated to, uh, to a CPU. So here, for instance, you can see like it's a, an example of four new nodes. And for that, what we did, we use it several techniques to keep the data within the new node and all the threads working on that data, we jailed them, we pinned them to that node. For that we used something called, we did uh, like a call to native libraries like libnuma, libpthread. For that we used something called Java native access, which is much more flexible than the GNI. You don't have to write C here, you just write Java code. So that was for the software you write, if you want to leverage as much as you can from the language. But now the language has also to help you a bit. The garbage collection um, didn't evolve as the application evolved and as the hardware evolved in the past years. So at a given stage, it, become, it became a, a bottleneck. This is why you will see that in the, in the JDK 9, by the way, how, how many people are using already Java 9? Java 8, Java 7, 
still. Okay, so Java 8 mostly, okay. Some of the garbage collection algorithm are deprecated for the JDK 9. And the default garbage collection is the G1 GC. I will describe this later on. So the idea is to have a garbage collection algorithm that won't suffer from, that is where the post time is not proportional to the heap. Because if you want to start a JVM on a few terabytes, you will suffer a lot if, it is, if the post time is proportional. Your users won't be happy. You will have a lot of pauses. You will have stop the world all the way, all the time, and then you have to restart your application. So this is why the G1 GC is now the default garbage collection. Everything good? Is the default garbage collection, and we'll see why, and the effort that has been made. The garbage, the G1 GC deals with region. We don't have this block of young survivor, two blocks of survivor, and all gen. Now you have the memory and you split that in region. And every region can have a different policy. A region can be uh, young, old, or survivor. What you see in purple is like what we call humongous region. I won't detail that, but you may have that you may have an allocation that spans over a region. We call this humongous region. Good to know if you have some tuning to do. Of course, you can define the size of a region. You can change that. And this is the garbage collection we played with in 2016. So let's see the cinematic of uh, G1 GC before I tell you what was the effort that has been made by the Oracle JVM engineers. Let's see the, the usual, what, how G1GC is supposed to work. So when you start your application, you start allocating some objects. Okay. Those objects, the short living objects will be allocated, as you know, in the young region. And from time to time, young or Eden region gets full, and then you have to do some young collection. Every time you have a young collection, that will happen. In the G1 GC, you have this pose that you see here, STW, means like stop the world, or pause. You, you're pausing the application. You try to pause. This is what the G1 GC tries to do. It pauses the application to do some young collection. And when we talk about collection, we are evacuating objects from we, we, we get all the live objects, we evacuate them somewhere, and then we leave garbage behind. And most of the time, let's say a normal application where you don't have a cache, or like our application where you don't have um, where you long living objects, mo most of the time, what you keep in terms of live objects is a small fraction. You use the object, then you throw it. So you leave a lot of cache, and this is why the young collection um, like the, the, the young collection threads come, the garbage collection thread comes, and then keep cleaning and evacuating your object from one region to another. When you do the evacuation of a young uh, object, from Eden, the objects are moved, the, 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 the live objects, they are moved to what we call a survivor region. Technically, survivor region still belongs to the young region and so on and so forth. So your application is evolving and then you keep moving the object from young to survivor. And at a given stage, your object, the long living object will end up in the old gen, tenured space. And then they will stay there. So the young collection at this stage doesn't care about those long living objects who ended up in an old gen region. We leave them there. until the IHOP happens. The IHOP stands for initiating heap occupancy percent. This is a parameter you can play with. It's 45% by default, which means if you reach the threshold, 
the funny part starts. And now we pause. We have a pause where we do what we call the initial mark. We start looking at all the live objects in the old gen. So here there is a pause. And then we start marking all those objects. The interesting thing is this marking happen concurrently, happens with your application thread. So here we do not pause the application. And as you can see, from time to time, while you're marking the, th marking the, uh, the, thre the marking threads are working, you will do young collection. Young collection will still happen. You, you'll do small pauses and young collection will happen. Then once this concurrent marking stops, you will do what we call a remark, where you check all the live objects that you marked, including the new object that happened between the initial, the initial mark and the remark, because you create objects while you're doing uh, the marking threads. As I said, it happens in, in, in concurrently with your application threads, so potentially you create some new objects there. After the remark, we collect statistics about the old regions. And we, try, we start looking at the regions that we're going to clean. And we'll prioritize the region with a lot of uh, garbage. Maybe some of you know it already. G1 means garbage first. It is a short form of garbage first. So the region with a lot of garbage, I will clean them first. The cleanup phase is where we decided what are the regions that I'm going to collect. Then just to free as much as I can, I do a very last young collection. And then I do what we call the mixed collection, where I will collect all those regions that have been selected from the old gen. And then back to square one. So this is the whole cinematic of the garbage collection, of the G1, GC operation. So you do not, we started with the normal young collection, and then we start doing the marking, and then at the end I do the mixed collection. The very important thing that we do here, we don't stop brutally the application and we do a full GC. Especially if you do a full GC, on a heap with few terabytes, it's devastating. Believe me, few terabytes, we had that and you, had to, you have to restart the server. It's, you, you can just have those mixed collection. If you have the full GC, it will scrub everything. Okay, before I detail this, The effort that has been made was on the young collection with the Oracle engineers, because uh, we noticed it where with this benchmark that the young GC was not as good as we expected. Actually, when we started the first time playing with the G1 GC on our use case with a few terabytes, some part of the, of, of the G1 algorithm scaled pretty well. And this use case, um, this, those, this, is f this first benchmark I'm, I'm sharing with you, was made on a static data set. When I say static data set, it means like I loaded the, the active pivot, which is the name of our database. We, I loaded everything with a static set. And then I start firing some queries, short queries, queries with, quite, like, with, with uh, some calculation, and query with what we call a full scan which means like I try to get terabytes of data. What you see here is the number of garbage collections by pose. For the short queries, it was quite okay. Five seconds, on average, quite okay. But when we start doing something quite complex, having a pause of 30 seconds, 
Here I'm talking only about young collection. I'm not talking about um, full GC as I mentioned. 30 seconds was too much for an interactive application. This is what we claim for our product. Like, okay, you use it, you use everything in memory. Remember the use case I mentioned earlier? We want you to take a decision on the spot. So if you have to wait 30 seconds to take a decision, it's, it's not interactive anymore. So then we started collaborating based on that to make those metrics better. And since this happened on a static set, we load everything and then we let the queries happen. Every time we see a garbage collection, most of the time this was for the short living object, for this transient memory. You fire a query, then you collect the results, you generate some, you fill the heap, and then you collect that. So let's see the, the improvement that happened on that part. The improvement of the young collection was as follows. So first of all, the GC threads, how do they work? They start from the root object, and then they start to resolve all the outgoing references. And every time you find a reference, you cannot move immediately what you find in terms of live objects to another. You cannot evacuate everything right now. You have to enqueue. You keep enqueuing the references in what we call, so those are the GC threads. We enqueue in the public buffer, and we enqueue the references in the private buffer. Why do we have public and private buffer? That is mostly to um, have a smoother work balance. So before what happened is when, say, we have two threads, two GC threads that are working. There is one thread which has a public buffer full, private buffer full. The thread two finished with his private buffer and finished with his public buffer. So then the, this existed before we asked uh, Oracle engineers to make some effort. They were using work stealing to help so the thread that is done with his work don't remain idle and start helping the other thread. But the work stealing happens only on the public buffer area. And you may get flooded in the private buffer. Maybe you faced this use case in the past. So you have all the threads idle. You see only one GC thread doing the job. And all the rest, all the other threads are looking at him like, OK, do the job now. So that wasn't good. And especially that in the private buffer, sometimes when you get um, huge arrays, all the references were copied there. And that was part of the cause of the uh, flooding. So what they did is they changed that by processing those huge arrays by chunk. And they added the way of refilling from the private buffer. We can refill the public buffer, so we give work to other threads who want to help. And based on that effort, the same benchmark you saw in red in 2015, now we have something more um, predictable. And we have less poses, especially on the second and the third case. So this was really interesting for us, just the effort that has been done on the young collection. However, for our use case and our product, we do not deal only with static data. Our customers, what they want is to have intraday data coming in. Um, some transactions happening, a guy doing a, a trade, or some people buying on an e-commerce website, and then you process the order. So there is, um, th th there is some um, mixed workload. You have read and write. And this test that we did at that time was with read only. You load everything, and then I allow you to do some queries. At that time, when in 2015, when we played with the read and write, nothing worked. <laughs> so then 
we decided to improve that by enhancing um, the parallel marking phase where we notice it that when you load when you have when you have some intraday activity when you have like read and write happening in your database the mixed workload the, this sorry the marking phase the parallel marking phase if you recall well this this part this part here the concurrent marking that was happening we start doing marking the objects but that was taking ages while there is an activity young collection young collection trying to happen you feel the young um, um, the young area you feel the young generation you feel the tenured space and at a given stage everything got stuck and you finish having a full GC and everything was um, crashing so that pushed us to do some effort on the um, um, collection of the old gen and especially on the parallel um, on the parallel marking same as the garbage collection thread we have marking threads the marking thread they do the same job but they don't evacuate the objects from one region to another this is a heap region called the cart and every this is here we are zooming on um, on a marking thread and every marking thread starts looking at the different live objects and if it finds a live object it, he has to write somewhere and say oh in this region I found a live object the way we remember those live objects we use that in what we call um, a data bitmap so every uh, every 512 bits this is what we call a card we have um, a down sample area there in the bitmap which is one bit so if I find an object in one card so then I turn the bit on on the, on the, on the bitmap so this was for one marking thread so if you have few it's okay but on a huge deployment that bitmap becomes a bottleneck because every marking thread was having a copy of the bitmap so this is why G1GC was not well sized a long time ago now was not well sized for um, a lot of threads and like multiple cores and a, a huge um, a huge memory on, on the server you're working with so to tackle that what the engineers at Oracle did is they have one one single bitmap that is shared shared across all those marking threads because if you have if every thread has a copy of the bitmap then at the end of the day you have to merge them and those bitmaps if you have several several of them at the end of the day those bitmaps they have you, you're looking to um, collect the memory and that was itself a bottleneck so they changed it totally the design and they were having only one bitmap shared across all those threads and then they use a lock free mechanism to access it and to maintain and to remember all the live objects that was the first improvement on the uh, parallel marking the second improvement same as uh, same as the GC threads the marking threads they have a private buffer and a public buffer to enhance the work balance what we noticed is that that public buffer was guarded by mutex it was a very very simple structure that allows only one thread to access at a time so by releasing that and having a lock free um, type of structure I'm not saying lock free is a contention free there is still some contention but by just sending this we had 50 times uh, the improvement by 50 times in terms of uh, parallel marking 
And as you can see here, we were able to do our mixed load reading and writing at the same time. So on the right, you can see for short queries and for full scan, you have read only with static data and read and write where we were changing one terabyte of data every minute to simulate a huge activity. We're a bit aggressive to see how it behaves. And you can see like the read and write versus the read only is less, less than two times in term of um, um, in, t in term of number of garbage collections. Notice that the resources were also used to change and to reshuffle the data and to refresh the data there. So all the effort that we did with the all, all, all the actually our effort was to build the application and to ask the Oracle engineers for help. And the job they did allow us today to build applications. Do, do not fear uh, the usage of few terabyte of RAM. Today, if you want to get a machine in five minutes, you can have a machine with at least two terabyte of RAM on AWS. The X1 Large is a machine that's having two terabyte of RAM. It's very, it's very easy to have on, on uh, Azure as well. On, on, on all the cloud providers, you can have a virtual machine with few terabyte which means you can, by storing, of course, it has to uh, address a certain use case where you're looking for speed. If you can do something with SQL and your client or the guy who is sponsoring your project doesn't care about taking a decision right, uh, right now, of course, do not, do, not, do not go to that path. But if you're looking for performance, Java can do it. And in end of November, there is... I read something here. Oh. <coughs> Sorry, your stuff is blocking me. Anyway, there is a new garbage collection that will be probably open source, made by the Oracle engineers, which is named Z Garbage Collection. This garbage collection claims to have poses of few, like 10 milliseconds, <coughs> on huge heaps. It's made, like their mindset now is to target huge heaps. Red Hat as well, they have their own garbage collection, which, is, which will be in competition with this ZGC. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Any question? I know it's a heavy topic, <laughs> but... F feel free. If you have any question, don't be shy. I'll try to answer it. Yes, please. Excuse, excuse. Yes, we, we played with, um, with uh, Azul VM. Azul VM, uh, okay, actually I played with a few years ago. They will have, it, they have this, um, it's called the Xing, and their garbage collection is called C4, like the... Um, in terms of it's poseless it's poseless however most of the time you use a lot of CPU to do the garbage collection behind the scene and on our product when we, we did a benchmark Oracle JDK that you can download versus Azure Xing that you have to pay for we compared both and we noticed that the post time was really good on Azul. However, the response time and end-to-end -end for, uh, for, for our queries were better on Oracle JVM. So I guess that, of course, they're famous for that, and I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they are racing as well against those um, ZGC and other garbage collections to, to make um, Java better. At the end, at the end is wh what you have here, you will have it in the open JDK, so it's good for us if, if you want to. On a yeah, it's good. Competition is always good. Yes, please. What are the GC poses like before you use it for your product? Um, <laughs> good question. Actually, um, and luckily, the, 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 when, when we start dealing with a huge set of data, before, before when I start, um, for a long time, I was working with the parallel old um, garbage collection. We're having maybe 
tens of seconds, but the set of data wasn't that big. So when our clients start challenging us on the, on the size of the data that we can handle in memory, the, the, the JVM was already better. And today for my clients, um, by default I'm using JDK8. I'm, I'm working for like most of our clients, at least in Singapore, they're in the banking industry. They're, they didn't move to, as you know, like in the banks, they're quite, like, it takes them time to, to, <laughs> to move from uh, one version to another. So today, most of them, they're using JDK8. By, by default, it's easy for me to convince them to turn the G1GC on. By the way, G1GC is good on JDK8, even better on the GK, JDK9, but on the JDK7, it was so-so. It started with the JDK7, I think it was experimental. So if you are on the JDK8 and you have some issues uh, with your garbage collection, give a try with the G1GC. G1GC claims to be, um, by default, if you read, they will tell you, just turn the G1GC on and do not tune it, it will work. But believe me, you have to do some effort when you start doing some tuning and you have to understand what's happening there. There is some um, interesting flags, like um, the, the you can fix a threshold, like the max pause you want to do or the, max, the maximum mixed collection you have to do to reach all what, like all, all what you have to connect, uh, collect or you can resize the regions. For example, if you have humongous objects ending up spanning across two regions, so you can make your regions bigger, so then you don't have humongous issues anymore. But the best thing you can do when you start playing with the G1GC is to turn all the logging on. And it's quite explicit, actually. Of course, you have to understand all that cinematics I, I was mentioning, but their, their logging is, is better than what you probably was used to with the CMS and the old gen. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you.